Coral have been around for a long time, over 500 million years if you count the early forms. And in that time, even after mass extinction, they managed to re-emerge, despite having to reinvent themselves. Indeed, coral are highly adaptable. And this is why scientists talk about coral as being resilient, and why there's hope that some coral might even survive climate change. But humans have shifted the balance, evolving at a pace unseen in the natural world. As apex predators, we've multiplied unchecked, altering the atmosphere in a single century. And since ocean and atmosphere are always in exchange, the result has been an unnatural rate of change in the ocean and the gradual decline of coral reefs worldwide. This is especially relevant for reefers since our aquariums are like a model of this problem of instability. In our aquariums, as in our oceans, when we unintentionally cause abrupt change, we're met with serious consequences. And that's why, as reefers, we become keenly aware of the influence we have over natural systems, since the devastation of coral reefs is acted out in miniature in our very own homes. We witness firsthand what most people will never see, unless we film it. But how did we get here? In the oceans and in our own systems, why are we so often disturbing coral? And how do we recognize the signs of stress before it's too late? Today, we're gonna explore these questions, seeing how the perils of coral in the aquarium can help us appreciate those of coral in the ocean. With any reef aquarium, you want to pay close attention. You want to be familiar with the neighborhood, so to speak, so that when something is wrong, you recognize it quickly. Because when coral are dying, time is money. Here one day and gone the next, what you have to master in reef keeping is the art of reading signals. And this morning, all signals indicate that something is very wrong. Although the lights are still ramping up, these coral don't look the way they should at this hour. The polyps should be expanding in the morning light, but instead, they're barely opening. On closer inspection, it's clear that some haven't opened at all, an obvious indicator of problems. These particular polyps are rapidly closing, almost as if in pain. A quick glance from the other side of the tank and the situation takes on a whole new urgency because the tissue at the base of these polyps has actually decayed overnight. Something is seriously wrong in this tank and it's time to take action, but not before taking all things into consideration. Because in reefing, what you don't do can be just as important as that which you do. And the last thing you want now is to compound the problem with uninformed action. A lot is on the line, from the animals themselves to the money invested in coral. And it's only natural to be anxious. But anxiety isn't going to help the coral. Like a doctor making a diagnosis, this is a time for cold, calculated analysis. Unfortunately, you have to go to work and can't call in citing coral illness or your colleagues will think of you, shall we say, differently from now on. This is unfortunate because you know the disintegrating flesh is likely the result of slow tissue necrosis or a bacterial infection attacking the coral's cells. And with STN, the term slow is a misnomer because it can actually progress quickly and therefore needs to be stopped as soon as possible. All day at work, you think about this. Everyone wonders why you're so upset and you can't tell them it's because of coral because then they know how little you care about anything else. Flash forward to your arrival back home and it's time to get to work. First, you test your water parameters. And even though your numbers are in order, you spend the rest of your night making new salt water. 
By 3 in the morning, as you listen to the hum of the RODI booster pump, your love for the hobby wavers. In the morning, you change the water, because while you don't have all the information yet, there are very few things a water change won't help. But this is where the troubleshooting grows in complexity, because the STN, while serious, is likely only a symptom of a bigger problem. In an example of what scientists call cascading interactions. These domino events have one initial cause, but can have many consequences. And they're set into motion by three things, chemical, physical, and biological disturbances. On coral reefs, we see this playing out with the anthropogenic rise in ocean temperatures, which cause corals and their algae to create toxic byproducts. In a quick effort to protect itself, the coral then expels the algae, but in doing so, also loses its primary energy source. Another instance is eutrophication, or the pollution of seawater due to runoff, which causes explosive algae growth that eventually decays, acidifying the water and killing coral. And if you investigate more of these cascading interactions, what you'll find is that they typically have one thing in common, human influence. Likewise, when solving problems in the reef aquarium, the first consideration should always be what have you done lately? In this case, one thing comes to mind. Exactly a week ago, you connected a chiller to the aquarium. And this event lines up with the outbreak of issues. It lines up so well that you feel almost certain it's the cause. But how exactly? The answer lies in the invisible world of the coral holobiont. The holobiont is a microbiome of bacteria, fungi, archaea, zooxanthellae, and the coral host itself that all work together to maintain homeostasis. The way this works is that the coral's tissues secrete carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins that various organisms, including bacteria, are drawn to. And in exchange for these compounds, certain bacteria have evolved to provide benefits to the coral. A mucus layer coating the coral's epidermis acts as intermediary, allowing these bacteria in for the molecular goods and other functions they provide. But that doesn't mean pathogenic bacteria aren't present. Both beneficial and potentially harmful bacteria inhabit this zone. Fortunately, evolution led coral to develop genetic predispositions for certain immunity-boosting bacteria. And it's believed that these core bacteria are what regulate the competitors and pathogens, rather than the coral itself. So when conditions are favorable, symbiosis allows both coral and core bacteria to regulate the mucus boundary zone and maintain immunity. But when coral are weakened by stressor events, the makeup of the mucus layer can change. And in some cases, pathogenic strains, which were previously controlled, now multiply rapidly, attacking the coral's tissues. But how would adding the chiller cause this to happen? Well, it's possible there were dissolved organic compounds in the chiller, which made their way into the display. And these organic compounds could have fueled the growth of bacteria prone to virulence. Bacteria which, if given the chance to outcompete core bacteria, do so by consuming the contents of cells, or more specifically, coral tissues. So did connecting the chiller kick off a biological disturbance? It certainly seems possible, but there's one other theory we need to consider, and that is chemical disturbance, or the possibility that something toxic was introduced when connecting the chiller. Toxins are textbook models of cascading interactions at play. Consider, for instance, the effect of sunscreen. Many sunscreens contain a UVA and UVB blocker called oxybenzone, which is able to absorb UV radiation and release it as heat before it can damage our skin. But in coral, this compound is modified automatically, and the resulting structure only allows the UV to be captured, but not released, causing rapid damage. In our aquariums, this kind of problem comes down to scale, or pollution relative to water volume, 
given that our systems are so small. But amazingly, that's also what we're seeing in the oceans. Collectively, we introduce enough toxins to the ocean that scientists believe it's impacting reefs. So although dilution is the solution to pollution, at a population of 8 billion people, even the ocean struggles to get the job done. In the case of the chiller, was there something on the new PVC tubing, some chemical from manufacturing that acted as an irritant inside the mucus layer, weakening its immunity and tipping the balance in favor of the bad guys? To rule this out, you'll do an ICP test, but the result will take some time. Thankfully, time might be on your side again, as signals indicate the tissue necrosis has stopped. However, you're not out of the woods yet, and with two potential explanations, you hope the ICP result will clarify things. In looking at the cascading interactions in each of your theories, it's now easy to see why so many things disturb coral, since their health is intimately tied to the microbiome around them. Unbalance one thing, and the dominoes start to fall. Fortunately, there are signs given by coral that can warn us of these invisible problems. The catch is that we have to pay close enough attention to notice. Coming up in part two of this investigation, we're gonna take a closer look at the role of bacteria in coral, seeing how we can harness these microorganisms for recovery. And we'll get an ICP result that finally gives us an answer. So be sure to subscribe so that you can catch the next video as we work to restore this reef to its former glory. Be good to the planet, my friends, and we'll see you next time on Coral Explorer.